Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Wednesday, April 24th, 2019 Market Watchers Live Show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Let's take a look at what's going on in the market. Dow Jones Industrial Average currently down 11 points. The S&P 500 down one, uh, one and a half points, but it did set an all-time record close yesterday uh, above that 2931 level. The NASDAQ also moved to a uh, record high close and an intraday all-time high as well yesterday, and it has uh, moved above that today. Currently, it's up about two points. Russell 2000 moving back up toward that 1600 level, up another five points today, and for the second straight day, leading on a relative basis. We haven't seen that much of late. Uh, 10-year Treasury yield continuing to drop down five basis points today to 2.52%. Really low interest rates and a dovish Fed, good combination so far. The market likes it. Volatility index continues to be in this downtrend, although today it is up about three and three quarters percent. But still, I would say off of the, that double top that we saw near 18, trending lower, and that's good for the market. Leading to the upside today, we have a couple of defensive areas. We have real estate and utilities moving higher. Energy is the weak area. That is down more than one percent today. You can see one of the industry groups here really struggled to get through 305. That's what's weighing on the energy group. Uh, we are down 2% there. Anadarko Petroleum. Uh, we did get uh, a second offer in on Anadarko. Of course, we had that original offer by Chevron. There was a second offer that came in. Stock trading hired. Looks like maybe a bidding war, uh, but APC certainly have another strong day. A lot of earnings out, mostly good earnings, mostly good reactions. But iRobot, not in that category. iRobot really getting hit hard today. Down $27 from 130 down to 103 on its earnings report. We'll take a look at that chart in just a couple minutes. But first, let me bring in my co-host, Aaron. How are you doing today, Aaron? I'm doing quite well today. I don't know if you watched that. Probably not. It was late on your side. But the San Jose Sharks Vegas Knights game last night, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Probably the best uh, period in hockey I've ever watched the third and the third period. It was amazing. San Jose came back from a, let's see, they were losing three to nothing, got a major penalty on the other team. So they got to run a five minute power play and they got uh, four goals <laughs> in five minutes. It was amazing. I tell you, I saw it and I got to say that I think the in injury influenced the officials in that game. I mean, anybody who watched the game, I did not think that that infraction was a major. I, I think that uh, Vegas really uh, got the rough end of that. State. Really? Oh, okay. So I disagree, but you know, that's, that's how we are in the show. So <laughs> yeah. <my dream. laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I mean, I thought the cross check was just a normal cross check. I mean, I did not think that there was anything major about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, they put the they put it on um, the cross check uh, guy, but it was really the second one who grabbed. You know, as the guy was falling, you know, he kind of grabbed him, pushed him to the ice, and of course, head hit it. And who knows? Yeah, yeah I get it. I understand, but it's just a. They tough just thing. called it on the wrong person, in my opinion. But I, you also have to say, I mean, Vegas. Listen, you're you're up three goals. Five minute power play. Okay, maybe you give up one goal. Yes. Maybe two, but four. I mean, it's kind of hard to feel sorry when you can't stop uh, anything over yeah. a period. But anyhow, we could talk hockey all day. I want to bring in our special guest, Danielle Shea. Danielle, it's been a while since we had you on the show, but welcome back to Market Watchers Live. Thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure. I know you have uh, some very interesting. Uh, uh, a very interesting discussion today, talking a little bit about how you trade stocks into earnings. And of course, it's earnings season. So this is going to be very timely. Excellent. Yes, I'm looking forward to talking about it with you, too. All right. Hang in with us because we're going to bring you back in in about 15 minutes. I promise we won't go much beyond that. And uh, we'll get into your presentation. OK, great. Thank you so much. All right, Aaron, take it away. All righty. Here is our upcoming schedule. Talking Technically, a segment we've been premiering is going to continue. We'll see that tomorrow. Greg Schnell is going to be with us on Monday to cover for me. I'll be out. And then I'll have the workshop as soon as I return. Not sure when I'm going to do it on. Your suggestions are always welcome. And then the following day, my dad's going to be in. And it's May 1st, so he's going to uh, talk monthly charts, and he's bringing his earnings chart that I know everybody loves. So you'll want to stay tuned and 
join us next week. Today, we've got Danielle here, as you heard. She's going to be telling us about uh, the run into earnings and trading options at that time. 10 and 10, our first symbol is going to be Zillow, ZG. And then finally, we're going to finish with the segment, What Would You Do? And please go take the poll because that is going to be pretty much what we're going to talk about. So get involved. All right, Tom, technical news and headlines. All right. Well, we didn't really have any uh, technical news, so um, we'll just jump right into the earnings reports and I will bring up the 10 year Treasury yield in just a couple minutes to show you that. But uh, first, these were earnings reports that came out yesterday after the bell. So uh, you can see, first of all, one thing that really stood out to me is that just about all these companies are matching or beating estimates. And so if you're wondering about a catalyst for the stock market to go higher, a lot of these earnings uh, estimates, in my opinion, the bar was really dropped. And so I think companies are having an easier time getting past these numbers and it's sending a lot of uh, traders into uh, uh, buying many of these stocks, especially those that uh, you know are momentum traders because many of these, these names have been performing really well. Uh, but those are the earnings reports that came out last night. We also had a slew of them coming out this morning. So uh, we'll bring up that slide and show you that one as well. Um, the one that really caught my attention this morning was Boeing. And Boeing came out, uh, out and said that they were dropping their guidance for 2019 and that they were halting or pausing their share buyback. And I, when I saw that, I was like, oh, my gosh, they must be getting killed in pre-market. And I looked and they were up four dollars. And I was like, OK, that's the kind of market we're in right now. Um, where the market simply doesn't care, especially for some of these larger companies that have had great track records for many years. I think Boeing is getting a pass today with the stock trading higher. And uh, But again, you look down this list and every single one of these stocks uh, and the, the last slide and this slide, for the most part, are companies that have about $25 billion in market cap or higher. So we're talking about some of the larger cap companies and you see these earnings reports coming in better than expected. And I think that's why we're seeing the S&P and the NASDAQ moving to all time highs. All right, let's pull up a couple of charts here. First, I'm going to show you that 10 year Treasury yield. Um, we are dropping back down today, down four or five basis points. You know, on the one hand, I look at this and I say, well, this I've got to be cautious. But look at what the 10 year Treasury yield has been doing for the last four or five months. It continues moving lower. Normally, what that would mean to me is that the bond market is suggesting there could be some economic weakness ahead. That's gener generally why you would see uh, yields dropping. But the other thing it could be signaling is simply that we don't have an inflation problem and maybe deflation is more of a concern than inflation. And that might be one of the reasons why the 10 year treasury yields dropping. And when you've got a Fed that has moved from a very hawkish position at the end of 2018 to a very dovish position in 2019, and we've got moderate growth, you put all this together and it's really nirvana for equities. So I'm not surprised we're getting that all time high and I suspect we're going higher from here. We could certainly have pullbacks, but I believe we're gonna see much higher equity prices in 2019. And I believe over the next several years, the stock market is gonna to continue to enjoy a bull market run. Now, as far as individual stocks go, let's first start off with iRobot because IRBT had been a little bit of a darling, especially back in February, March. And look at the relative strength at the end of February. This was a stock that was performing very well relative to its peers. But remember, its peers were not particularly strong versus the S&P 500. So now all of a sudden we got a report that the market doesn't like. Um, and iRobot, by the way, did, they did beat on their bottom line, but they came up pretty far short on their top line. 237.7 million in revenue. Market was expecting 251.4. This is not good. Now, if I annotated this, and I would not be in this stock. Of course, I've said before, I don't like holding stocks into earnings. So I would have been out before this anyway. But if I'm looking for where we might see a turn, I'm going to say in this range, because we had a double top that we took out with uh, the February uh, earnings. And uh, with that move, we continued powering forward. And the day of those earnings, you can see we gapped up and the low that day was down around 94. So I think this breakout around 101 down to the low the day after earnings around 94. This is a range where I might look for reversing candle or something like that, because we are, in my opinion, still in a bull market. But 
I would be careful about trying to catch a falling knife at this point. I'd let the stock settle down first. A couple of other stocks that uh, we can talk about that reported earnings. I want to start with Texas Instruments. TXN reported after the bell yesterday. And I'm going to pull this one up on a relative basis as well because we know semiconductors have been on fire. On a relative basis, Texas Instruments has not really been that strong. And yes, we're seeing a move to the upside today, but really not a whole lot of relative strength. It's kind of going up with the overall group and not necessarily uh, because of Texas Instruments earnings. They did beat on their top line. They beat on their bottom line, but their guidance was simply in line. So they didn't raise guidance. Big volume. We're trying to get a breakout. I think this is bullish. But again, when you look at the relative strength, I think there are a lot of names out there that look a lot better to me, one of which reports after the bell today, and that's Xilinx. When you look at Xilinx, you got a stock that has been moving up along with the group. But on a relative basis, Xilinx has been one of the best performers. And if we go to the uh, dashboard and take a look at these scooters, take a look at what is the number one scooter among large cap stocks, Xilinx. So there's a lot of reasons to like this company going into earnings. I would be absolutely shocked if they dropped a bomb on the market. I think you're going to see an excellent report out of Xilinx after the market closes. My only question is whether or not Xilinx goes higher after earnings, because a lot of this could already be built in based on the way the stock has traded over the past few months. I mean, we're talking about a stock that was down below 70 in October. Now it's at 140. Remember, the stock market just recently went back up above those highs that we saw. And during that time frame, Xilinx has doubled. So the leadership relative to the S&P 500 ought to be quite uh, easy to spot here. So Xilinx is certainly one that I would keep an eye on. Um, Stryker, S-Y-K. This is in the medical equipment space, I believe. Let's pull up S-Y-K. And now this is one that I, I was wondering what might happen because... The stock had been one of the leaders. First of all, here it is medical equipment. Medical equipment, all of a sudden in April, has kind of fallen out of bed. This was a group that was showing tremendous relative strength versus the S&P 500. You can see that Stryker was outperforming the S&P. And Stryker, since bottoming back at the end of 2018, had been outperforming on a relative basis versus its medical equipment peers. So I was wondering what might happen based on everything that was taking place on this chart and I think what's, what the market is telling me is that we probably saw a bottom uh, down around this 175 level. And just like I showed you on the prior chart or the earlier chart, um, trying to think which one it was, but uh, um, well, it already escaped me. That's what happens at my age. But anyway, at, uh, at the end of January, you can see the gap up on Striker. And I never look for the bottom of gap support. When I see a gap like this on heavy volume and we keep seeing buying on the way up, I looked at the top of gap support. Notice where we reversed on Striker right at that level before we started making this run back into earnings. We gap lower earlier today, but we are starting to turn back to the upside up 14 cents. My biggest question is, are we going to get back up above those moving averages? If so, I think that's bullish. If not, look for 175, uh, maybe another test down the road. eBay reported last night. eBay is one I've been watching for a while, and we're trying to get that breakout. We didn't get it on the open. So the question now is, do we get it on the close? Uh, eBay had started to pull back on a relative basis to its peers, but is now turning back up again. Um, but on a relative basis, its peers are turning down. So there's mixed signals here. I'd be careful if we don't make this breakout on eBay above the 39 level. And I could go on and on and on, but I'm only going to show you one more stock, and then we're going to get into upgrades and downgrades uh, so we can get to Danielle. Uh, but Snap... This is one that has been performing extremely well relative to the internet group. And you can see internet broke out relative to the S&P 500. Here was Snap. And in 2019, this has been a stock that's been performing really well. It did come out with its earnings that beat top line, beat bottom line. I would have anticipated that given the way that the stock has been trading. But notice it couldn't make the breakout and is now struggling. I think we might see some more sideways consolidation here on Snap. Okay, upgrades, downgrades, Aaron. Back to you. All righty, let's get it going. I have three upgrades for you and three downgrades. A lot of people have been asking me, where do I get these upgrades and downgrades? Um, I go to briefing.com 
and you can go right here to the calendars and, and do that. And then the other place I go, uh, because I don't think this list is always, <laughs> doesn't always include everything, I go to Market Watch. So just, to, just so you know where I'm going. All right, so let's start with uh, uh, Best Buy. It was upgraded today by Jefferies from a hold to a buy, and they have raised their uh, target from $72 to $88. Uh, I like the chart. We've got the PMO is starting to turn around here on this breakout from that descending wedge. That's a bullish pattern, so that's exactly what we should have expected. But it also has beaten out uh, overhead resistance here from those October and November highs. And now looking at it, um, you know, I, I think the $88 price target makes sense, but right now I'm just looking at that $82.50 level. Next one up, Procter & Gamble was upgraded today by Barclays from an equal weight to an overweight, and they have raised their target to $112. Uh, I, I noticed a few things here. Uh, one was a rising trend channel. And the problem is, is we're starting to see some deterioration of that rising trend. Uh, so I don't like that particularly. And you can see if you draw uh, uh, the tops, here in conjunction with that rising bottoms line, you end up with a bearish uh, rising wedge. Although I have to caveat that I've seen, there's a lot of bearish rising wedges right now. The S&P 500 has had one. It obviously it broke to the upside out of it, which I find especially bullish, but I'm finding a lot of these ascending triangles. So I, I, I kind of am looking at them with a grain of salt now. All right, next one up, Snap. And Tom, you did just talk about that. I won't spend too much time. But uh, Snap was actually upgraded today by JP Morgan from an underweight to a neutral. And they have moved their target from $7 to $11. So uh, definitely they are in that neutral space as far as Snap goes. Uh, and I'm with you. I don't like the way uh, we're trading today off of those earnings, especially when you look in the thumbnail here, we were in a declining trend and yesterday popped right above that. And now um, we're not able to, it doesn't look like we were gonna be able to maintain uh, that, especially when you're looking at the overhead resistance here in the short term. PMO looks pretty ugly. Uh, the good news is, is that in the intermediate to long term, you can see the scooter is in that hot zone. So, you know, we could see a, a bit of a turnaround here. I suspect if I look at the weekly chart, it looks pretty good. Indeed, a little bit overbought, but it's hard to say what overbought uh, and oversold are when you get a new stock like this on a uh, weekly chart. All right, next one up, let's go to downgrades. And here we go. Hilton was downgraded today from an outperform to a market perform. Uh, its target is now from $88. They've moved it to $90. And uh, I think this is a possibility here, mainly, again, because you have that strong scooter. Uh, but right now in the short term, I don't like it. Uh, you had that whipsaw. Um, uh, buy signal ended up with that sell and we're seeing lower readings from the previous low on the PMO. The only good news is right now it does seem to be hanging on to that 20 day EMA and to the support uh, on that March top. So, I mean, I, I can see why they went to a market perform. I mean, they went more neutral than anything else. All right, um, Harley Davidson was downgraded today. Goldman downgraded it from a neutral to a sell. Uh, they brought their price target down from $37 to $34. And notice you can see uh, the support and resistance levels that I've, I, I have marked. And interestingly, they fall right into the 37 and 34 area. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. I don't like Harley Davidson. I know they've been in the news. Uh, they're, they're having some problems. And with uh, European sales, I suppose, suspect, I think it was. Anyway, I don't like the chart technically, d despite the fundamental news, whatever. Um, you can see we were already losing momentum uh, quite a few days ago last week. And it's only continuing. And you've got that breakdown not looking too good. Notice OBV volume scooter. So intermediate and long term are starting to look bad. Not a good 
Uh, let's see, we got a last downgrade was Iridium Communications. I see a rising trend channel here, but we can't seem to get over that overhead resistance at uh, the annual high. It could end up being, that's probably a an all-time, but let's check. Yeah, an all-time high. So it can't quite get above that at this point, but we are in the rising trend channel. Uh, the market's starting to do pretty good. The PMO looks... Pr well, I mean, let's face it, it looks ugly. It tried to move up and now it's um, pulling right back down into that uh, descent. So not looking too good here. I would not be looking at a, a buy, but I mean, if you really, I mean, if you really wanted to do that, we are at the bottom of this trading channel and we are at the bottom of that rising trend channel. And that's all I've got for upgrades and downgrades. Here is the listing. I'll have those in the Market Watchers recap. Uh, you can see quite a uh, you know medium amount on the other upgrades and downgrades. All right, time to bring back Danielle and welcome again to the show. It is great to have you here. Can't wait to hear what you're going to be talking about. We talked a little bit about it before the show, and I think everybody's going to find it quite interesting. So let's go for it. Excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me back. Of course. Awesome. So my name is uh, Danielle Shea. So nice to meet all of you. I'm the Director of Options at Simpler Trading. I'm primarily a technical analyst. I use a lot of um, Fibonacci as well as trend following strategies overall. Um, and then also, you know, I am an expert commentator. I do um, some regular TV bits here and there. And I also like to post some ideas on Twitter. So those are all the different places you can find me. Um, today, I'm primarily talking about the run into earnings. So for me, um, in the options market, and I do trade stock as well, but I trade primarily options. My favorite times to trade are going to be the, you know, four to six week span of time before earnings season. So in the options market in particular, um, it's really important to time it properly because of the way that options are priced. Um, with options, unlike stock, you can run out of time. So when looking at an earnings season, these are the three key components of that, right? So you have the beginning, which is going to be the phase, phase one, the run into earnings. And that's primarily what we're going to talk about today. I do also do the other two phases. I like to trade the report um, in the options market, but I particularly love to trade the after earnings plays as well. So this presentation is just going to focus on the initial run into earnings. The reason why is because out of these three phases, um, this is the one that I find to be the most consistent and the most lucrative. While the others can be fun and exciting when they work, they're not as high probability as the run into earnings. So that is why I primarily focus on that one. Looking at where we're at today, I mean, today is April 24th, um, but I mean, really, this is relevant at at any point in time. Yes, it's relevant right now um, because we're really getting into the meat of earnings season this week. But, you know, of course, this comes around four times per year. And so the more that you can work on the strategy and hone it, the better you get each quarter. So this week in particular, when it's the week of FANG earnings, um, can get a little bit crazy, but it's also a good time to look for some of these different trades. So, for the trade setup, the way that I primarily trade it is I like to trade it with options um, for a couple different reasons. Number one, I mean, obviously, I like the leverage. Number two is because of the way that options are priced. So because of the way that options are priced, you get an increased bump on your money that you wouldn't get in stock when it comes from the implied volatility. So I like to trade it, you know, really just with basic long calls. I'll trade it with butterflies. Straddles also work if you want to make a neutral trade. Um, but I also will trade it with stock as well, kind of building up into a stock position, especially if I'm looking at um, something that I want to hold through the report. Typically with my options trades, 
I'm not going to hold it through the report. I just trade, you know, three weeks prior, and then you have the report right here, and then I get out. Whereas if it's a stock trade that I'm looking at, I will generally look to continue to build up positions. Like for example, CRM, Salesforce is one of the ones that I'm doing where you know you start three, four, five weeks prior to the earnings report, you get the report, okay, then it settles down again, you add some more before the next one, something like that. So here are just a couple different um, you know, comparisons that I like to look at. At the end of the day, all of the analysis that I do is based on the underlying stock chart. So, you know, I'm always looking at primarily the daily charts, and then I will go down to lower time frames. But um, the main reason why I do like to trade options is because you can trade in a directional or neutral manner. Uh, but the primary reason here is because you have a much lower capital investment required. So um, typically, you know, I can play with a lot less money than I would need if I'm building a longer term stock position. I also like the different option strategies that I can use. I like to do, um, you know, you, you have conservative option strategies, you have aggress aggressive option strategies. So you're really not stuck in one, you know, you're not stuck in one thing where you're just doing something really aggressive all the time. So as I've gotten more into my options career, I specifically like to use um, much more conservative strategies so you don't get a whole lot of craziness. Are there any questions so far? Are we doing good? No, I think we're probably good right now. Um, I do think it's interesting, though, that you mentioned, uh, Danielle, that there are aggressive option strategies and there are conservative option strategies because I think a lot of folks think of options and they think, well, they're too risky for me. But there are strategies, actually, that are that produce less risk. Um, and so I just wanted to point out, I thought that was interesting that you pointed that out to everybody. Oh, definitely. And I mean, I think in the beginning in my options career, I did a lot of just, you know, buying long calls and spreads, which can be a little bit more risky. But as I've gotten more into it, um, I particularly like to trade butterflies and unbalanced butterflies because they are so much more conservative. Um, and they also, they hold a lot better through different fluctuations in price rather than something like a long call that can lose its value quite quickly. So, you know, there's really just a lot of options. <laughs> options. <laughs> I got that. I got that. <laughs> so when you're looking at the pricing of options, there here's the primary variables that affect the price of an option. Number one is the price of the underlying stock. I mean, that's very critical. The second portion that you have are how many days until expiration. Typically when people trade options, the way that they lose money is they don't give themselves enough time. So if you buy something that expires in a day or two or in a week and your stock hasn't made its move yet, then yes, it's going to lose its value because the way that options function is they have a value and then as it gets closer to the time of expiration, they lose their value. So you have to give yourself enough time. The third portion of this that's particularly helpful during the run into earnings is the implied volatility. So options, um, a component of their pricing is based on how volatile the stock is going to be. Now, because, um, you know, we know when the earning states of the stock are, and of course they know that when they price options, what happens is that the implied volatility of the stock or of the option will rise going into the earnings date. So maybe like three or four weeks before the earnings date, the implied volatility is pretty low. And then it will start creeping higher, creeping higher, creeping higher as it get, gets close to that earnings date. And that's literally just the way that it functions. And because the implied volatility is a key component of how the option is priced, it makes the price of the option go higher. So this is a typical pattern that happens every single quarter. And so the the good part about it is that you know that is you know that's what's going to happen. So this means a few things. It means that number one, options cost more when the volatility is high, i.e., around the earnings report. 
So number one, we always tell people in our options room, I mean, you never ever go and buy long calls directly before an earnings report because the reason is, is they're basically just incredibly expensive. The price is juiced up. And then what happens after the earnings report is that implied volatility drops and the price of the option will drop. But if you already know this, you can use that fact to your advantage. So what you try to do is you come in and you say, okay, well, if I know that the implied volatility is gonna rise going into earnings, that's one key component of the price of the option that'll make the options price more expensive, right? So if I instead buy it before the IV begins to rise, a couple weeks before the report, then the price of your option is going up, right? And if you also, buy buy the options on a stock where the price is also working in your favor then you have kind of a a double a double whammy right because you have something that the price is going in your favor and the implied volatility is going in your favor the one thing that never goes in your favor is the days till expiration because i mean obviously you can't go back in time so you look at these two factors to kind of negate this one right here so that's the entire purpose of using options um, to trade this strategy. Now, obviously there's a lot of different components of that. It would take me a, a really long time to get into all of it. Um, but basically what I'm looking at are in the money options, at the money options, or out of the money options. Depending on um, where these options are in the option chain, they'll cost you a different amount of money. Uh, typically I like to stick with these and these just because uh, they, even though they're a little bit more expensive, they hold the value a little bit better going into earnings. Now, obviously, you know, I'm sure you've heard of a lot of different positives and negatives surrounding options. Yes, I mean, it's definitely a lot riskier than trading stock for sure. Um, they are priced so that you will lose money. That's the entire you know, point of how they do it. But if you know kind of like those tricks around it, then, you know, that's that's the goal. And that's kind of what you're focusing on, because with options, what you have to do to make money is you have to um, get in at a time where there's a greater than expected move without doing that. Um, then they're kind of priced to lose money. Right. So you have to be able to identify moments in time where price is going to expand, such as the run into earnings. So here's just another um, graph of the different option strategies that I like to use out of the money calls in the money calls, debit spreads, credit spreads, iron flies, butterfly, buying stock. And then I kind of make a graph here of the least risky to the most risky, just based on how much I like the setup. Um, and you know, whatever risk I have on at that time. So I kind of cycle through those different ones. So basically, I mean, here's just the concept that I was talking about, but essentially, you know, if you have an earnings announcement right here and you're looking to buy an option, then it's going to continue to rise in volatility. So the blue part right here is the volatility and that's a major component of that options price. So it just kind of trades higher going into the earnings report. And here's a couple of examples on the actual chart. So Amazon is one of my favorite ones to do. And I, I always look at this and I tell people, you know, just like any trade setup, it doesn't work 100% of the time. But if you look at it in the last seven out of eight times or the last six out of eight times it works, then, I mean, for me, that's, that's more than enough. So, you know, taking Amazon, for example, and then highlighting the earnings dates here and then looking at the amount of times that it has rallied directly into an earnings report. That's exactly what I'm looking to trade. Now this one, of course, that one did not work. That was during that, you know, correction that we got last fall. Um, but for the most part, Amazon is one that I trade every single quarter, primarily with butter butterflies and put credit spreads. The next one that I love is Microsoft. This one's pretty consistent, slow and steady. I also trade this one with stock and I love to add stock on any pullback in Microsoft. I mean, this thing is just a beast. Is that one of the ones that you look at for the uh, run into earnings? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I had to think Microsoft is a great looking stock, but there was a question in the room. I think this is a good time maybe to uh, bring this one up. Sure. The question is, why would you buy the stock when you can also have a synthetic stock using options? Why wouldn't you just stick with the option? Why would you do both? Um, because I have a variety of different accounts. So with uh, basically just money management, I mean, everybody looks at options and says, hey, you know, options is risky, which it is. So that's why from a money management perspective, if I have, you know, 100K or whatever, then I'll, I'll have 25K in my options account. And then I have the rest 75K in long term stock. And so this is kind of the, you know, slow and steady slow and steady wins the race. And this is the one that you're kind of like, okay, well, I'm going to try to double this. So I don't like to have all of my capital in options, even though I do love to trade options. And so what I do is I add the long term stock to the slow and steady accounts, and then I'll aggressively trade it in my options account. And I think that also helps you to um, it helps your options trades be better because if you know, okay, this is, you know, from a risk perspective, this is a quarter of my capital. And then from that, if you're risking half of that at any given time, then I don't know, it just makes you a better trader, I think. Right. Well, I've got a question for you. Do you know how to guarantee to uh, get to a million dollars trading options? <laughs> oh, guarantee? Hey, if I, if I knew a guarantee on that, um, I would be on a mountain or a, a mountain, top of the mountain somewhere in a cabin. I think that the best thing to do and what I do is I like to cycle my money out. So I think trading options, the hardest part about it is actually making money because you kind of get into, you get into, especially like a, the past three weeks, you get into kind of a, a thing where you're just used to seeing it's it's just so fun to buy a call and watch it double overnight. And that type of thing is kind of addictive. It's kind of like gambling. Right. And so I think the worst thing is, is when that when you're on a really good streak and you have to take money out. So for me, what I do is I cycle money out of my options account, whereas with my stock account, I just leave it in there and let it grow. So by coming in and taking your profits on stuff like that and putting it somewhere else, for me, I found really helpful because what happens is, is when you start making a lot of money, then you get more risky and more aggressive. And that is what prohibits you from essentially making your million dollars. Well, this was actually, that was actually a joke, Danielle. I was going <laughs> to say you have to start with $2 million. <laughs> No, but it's true. I mean, it's it's like people ask me that and it's just like, you know, it's just it's it's hard when you're in a good streak and that prohibits you. So <laughs> yeah, I just know for me personally, I, and I, I think it all comes down to how people can manage their own emotions. Oh, um, my gosh. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yes. Managing your emotions. Mm -hmm. Because you can lose a lot of money. I mean, that, and that's the thing. Sometimes you hit a couple of trades. And believe me, I've gone through it. Maybe you went through it at some point. But um, I know I, I've traded options before. I stopped trading them because I know my mentality and I know where my weakness is. And when I hit two or three of those options in a row, all of a sudden I feel invincible. And sometimes I start getting a little bit too aggressive. And then they, it would come back to haunt me because as soon as you start maybe taking a little bigger position or maybe doing some strategies that are a little more aggressive, that's when the trade goes against you. I can promise you I had some of those. Yes, that's exactly right. And so uh, my boss, John, he calls that kind of the mental plateau. And so that's why he um, he's always told me just, you know, just keep wiring money out. And then that way you try to avoid that. But so far, that's what I've been doing. And <laughs> do, you, do you use stop losses? That was a question that came in from the room. I mean, is that are your are your strategies such that you're already protected to the downside or do you use stop losses to protect? So it kind of depends. Um, it, it depends on how much money I'm putting into a given trade. When I do cheaper trades such as uh, butterflies and I'll spend, I'll spend a dollar 50 or $3, which is, you know, 150, $300 per contract for me, that's a pretty low risk. So for something like that, I won't have um, a stop on that. 
But if I'm doing a more aggressive strategy, for example, like buying long calls on Adobe, these are going to cost you $14, $15, $16 a piece, which translates into about $1,400 per contract. So for something like that, that's more aggressive than yes, I have a 50% stop loss. But for the more conservative trades, generally, I'll just let them go and I will risk what I'm willing to to lose for my stop loss. Okay, fair enough. Uh huh. Yeah, because the thing is, is in the options market, because it's so um, because it can be quite a roller coaster ride. The problem is, is that if you have a very close stop, you will never give yourself the opportunity to make your profit. So you, learning how to sit through the fluctuations is really important. And so that's why we actually usually say that we want you to risk what you're willing to lose so that you're able to learn how to sit through those fluctuations so that you can get to this point. Otherwise, if you just have a stop here, I mean, you're, you're just, you know, you're not, you're never going to get anywhere. Gotcha. Yeah. So here's the, um, here are the main points of this overall setup. I mean, you know, the basic idea is taking advantage of the bullish, bullish sentiment leading into key earnings dates. Like all setups, it's strictly technical, but it's mixed with a bit of fundamentals. So the main things that I look for is a solid trend. I want it to have a solid uptrend over at least the past six to nine months. Um, because of the correction last year, I give it a little bit of a break sometimes, but that's generally what I look for. I want to see price holding, uh, support and resistance. We use the voodoo lines at Simpler Trading, but you know Fibonacci, moving averages, I like that as well. I love a squeeze. Some of you may be familiar with that. Basically, it's just looking for consolidation that's going to pop. So in the options market, it's very important to get a greater than expected move. Um, and then I also always want a solid entry point. I always want a pullback buy. Always. Like no matter what I'm doing, I want a pullback buy. And then the fifth part of that, I call that the umph. This is when you have the fundamental backing behind you. So all of the technicals are great, but I also really want the fundamental backing. That, that last one you showed there, if you can go back, uh -huh. uh, you show a strong techie name. There was a question also that came in and asked about the types of stocks that you like to use options on. And the, specifically, they were asking about technology or what yes. big names. Yes. So I call those the Phoenix Flyers. So it kind of will shift around depending on, you know, whatever's going on um, in the market. But right now, my favorites are the Cloud Kings. I love the Cloud Kings. I love cybersecurity. Uh, those are pretty much my favorites. I also like the semis. So what these are, are the tech names that are outperforming the market. So again, in options to make money, you have to have greater than expected moves. Um, and like Xilinx, you were talking about Xilinx earlier. So one of my best trades this year was on Xilinx because I mean, that thing just exploded, right? And so um, those are the primary lists that I will trade from on, ag on an aggressive standpoint. I also love the uh, market leaders, the FANG stocks, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Netflix. I trade those over and over again. So for the run into earnings, those are the ones that the, the run into earnings works because there's hype going into the report. And so if you think of it that way, and if you think, okay, well, why is it trading higher going to the report? Well, because people are buying it in anticipation of a good report, right? So what industries have the most hype? And then you look at it that way, and then you can narrow them down based on the technical and fundamentals. All right, follow-up question. Mm -hmm. All right, so Xilinx, you said you've traded that one. And of course, Xilinx is reporting after the close today. Uh -huh. This is a stock that in the last seven weeks has gone from about 117 to 140. Obviously, the volatility, that implied volatility is going to be high. What would you think of a covered call strategy if you own the stock? That was another question that came out of the room. So I would not um, personally sell covered calls on Xilinx before a report. The main reason is because of, I mean, this has just been a phenomenal run right here. So I would not sell covered calls on something before a report. What I would do with this, um, there, 
you have to make a decision, you know, if you're going to actually trade the report or not. For me, I, if I was going to do something on this, I would have to sell like a bullish put credit spread just because this pattern is incredibly strong. The fundamentals on this are very strong. It's one of the most solid ones in its group. I call it a phoenix because it uh, rose from the ashes with incredible strength. I mean, last December when everything was completely eating it, Xilinx was just like, oh, I don't really care. I'll just hang out for a minute and then boom. So um, my favorite trade on Xilinx this year was I call it the 2x move. So you have a market maker expected move on this ticker and that's going to be about ten dollars so you have a ten dollar expected move and what i look for is on the report i want to see how much it actually moved okay so i don't remember what it was last quarter but whatever this move was it was two times the expected move so when a stock does that and it moves twice what it's expected generally what you get is a momentum follow through to the upside and so what you see is you see a breakaway gap that was never filled. So for me, that's incredibly strong. I wouldn't want to sell anything up here because of that strength. However, if you wait for after the report, maybe you could do something with it then. But with a pattern like this that has gap, runaway gap, 2x move, it's going out on a high right before a report, I can't look at that as any other way than bullish. And if for whatever reason, if it doesn't perform as well as it did last quarter and if it falls down a little bit that to me is a sale 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 and i would just buy more mm -hmm. i agree so, what, do you do, what do you do with the wide spreads on options do you try to take advantage of that so the wide spreads on the options are kind of a pain um this one's these ones aren't bad i mean this is you know about not even 50 cents these aren't it, it's really not too bad what i try to do is i come in in the middle so if there's a bid in the ask you just try to get that mid price in here for something like xilinx the bullish trades that i would typically do or just sell put credit spreads going into the report however i don't really like to do that when it's going out on a high extended off of the eight EMA, just because it's a pretty aggressive trade. Uh, for me, what I really like to do with something like this is just wait because after the report, something like that, I mean, this was one of my best trades of last earnings quarter, because if you buy that on the gap up and then it just takes off and options, I mean, that's, that's a lot of fun. So <laughs> that's yeah, what I like to do there. That would definitely be fun. <laughs> it's very fun when it works for sure i'm always uh on the lookout for the gap ups after after an earnings report but it has to be on the same thing like one of those strong names that um i would already do the run into earnings on okay yeah so i mean just i'm just gonna go through some of this quickly just because i had already picked out some names in here i mean i i went over the basics of the setup um, and I don't know if y'all give out slides, but I'm happy to send you the slides if you, if your members want to download them. But, um, you know, basically you're just looking for technical setup, strong support and resistance. I love the squeeze. I love to look for consolidation that's going to break out. That really helps the run into earnings. Um, I always want to get in on a pullback buy. So I use um, just the basic moving averages, 8, 21, 34, 50, 100, and 200. I usually like a pullback to the 21 or the 34 for my entry. Um, a big part of the setup is looking at the fundamentals. And so I like to use both Chaken Analytics and Investors Business Daily. And, you know, like we've been talking about uh, focusing on, you want to focus on what is hot. The reason why it works is because it's hot. Cloud King, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, uh, market leaders, those ones are the ones that are hot. Those ones are the ones that have the hype. And then I also like to look at, you know, whatever sector is strong at that moment. So I do a lot of different sector analysis. Obviously, you know, tech has been really bullish. Industrials have gotten a lot better 
after the hit that they took uh, last year with all the China news. And so I like to focus on stocks within the hot sectors, stuff like utilities, uh, not really looking at for a run into earnings. Consumer discretionary has been great, but it's almost ran so far that it's just, you know, there's only so, so much more it, it can go before you're going to see some rotation. Haven't seen it yet, but it's something that I'm looking for, but consumer discretionary, Nike, Home Depot, Amazon. I love trading those top weighted products going into the report. So this is basically just the, you know, breakdown of it. Just want the trend, directional calls. It's the best way to take advantage of it. I like it about three to four weeks ahead of time, but it has to be on a pullback. I will have a 50% uh, stop loss if it's a long option and if, it, and if it's expensive long option. I consider anything above about six or seven dollars, which is 600 to $700 a piece um, to be more expensive. The cheaper ones, I tend to just, you know, go into it with what I'm will willing to risk. The profit target is always Fibonacci extensions, but at the end of the day, I'm always, always, always getting out before the earnings report. So here's just a couple of different parameters for the options trades, the different deltas. It would it would take a while to get into that, but I'll just, you know, it's in the slide deck so I can send that to you, like I said. Um, but generally just doing an, a mix of in the money or out of the money options, depending on how long I have, depending on, um, the pullback that I got, depending on how much I like the stock. And so, you know, like I said, I just look for a combination of the hot industries. I use Chaken. Here's a list from Chaken that I pulled of, um, these are the strong bullish NASDAQ names because, you know, they're within the tech space. And then I combine that with the technicals. So, uh, because of the, you know, today it's the 24th, Microsoft earnings is already coming out today. We talked about some of the ones that I did before, Microsoft, Amazon, I'm in one for Google right now, Facebook and Apple, those ones have already, you know, taken off. Netflix is usually good this quarter, it stayed in consolidation until the report, but typically do like Netflix. Here are some of the ones coming up that I'm looking for. I'm in Zen right now. Alibaba is one of my favorites. Alibaba and Adobe. These are ones that I generally do every single quarter. Uh, Home Depot is actually pretty good as well. And these are some that I'm looking for. So CTSH, F5, O'Reilly, INTC, INTU, Salesforce, MDB. This is a new cloud name that I like, cloud and cloud. So I also really like credit card companies, payment processors, um, you know, MasterCard, Visa, American Express are pretty good. PayPal, I like. PayC is a good one. Um, and then here's just an example of the overall chart pattern that I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is something that was able to recover really quickly after the December correction. This is a chart of Zen on the daily chart. I'm looking for something that has stacked moving averages. You have price above your moving averages. You have nice steady pullbacks. This one in particular has a two-step pattern, which is a FIB pattern right into a level of symmetry support. Um, and then the squeeze is the consolidation. So this is just the TTM squeeze this is my number one indicator that I use for identifying um, explosive price movements. And then basically, you know, you're just looking for to buy this thing on the dip. So Zen is one that I'm in right now. It has earnings next week. You just buy it on the dip down to support. And then you look to trade that right into the earnings report. So, um, you know, just to conclude, and then we're, we'll have a little bit of time for questions. I, I, even though I do trade options and it is, you know, more risky, you really do have to understand that it's a leverage tool. It is more risky. And the main reason I like it and the reason why I started doing it is because you can do it with less capital than what you need for, you know, your stock account. So 
Um, it's just important to use them correctly. I would never, ever, ever advocate anybody just going out there and saying, oh, well, I'm just going to, you know, try and buy a bunch of options right before an earnings report or whatever. If you're going to put your money in something like that, you really do need to know, um, what you're doing and you need to learn how to limit risk. So if it's something that you're interested in, I mean, definitely don't just, you know, start slinging trades. (laughs) <laughs> and the other thing is I like to paper trade. I paper traded for two years almost before, well, a year and a half before I use the real um, real money. So that's also something you can do if you're interested. And then this is just my final, you know, this is just my uh, final page here, different places you can find me. I have a free newsletter at fivestartrader.com. I teach classes and then I'm also um, in our Simpler Trading Options Room, and then I have a membership for beginners at Simpler Foundation. That was excellent. I have there a couple of questions I want to follow up. Yes, I would love to answer the questions. Well, one was earlier, came in earlier about, you know, not understanding options and wanting to get some education and so forth. And you said, you know, you paper traded. Obviously, there's a big learning curve with options. What would you recommend to somebody who is, who is looking to get into options or at least learn more about them, where would you go? So within our, uh, within the different services that I do, Five Star Trader is good. This is just a free e-letter that you can sign up for um, where I talk about my stock picks, different trades that I do. It's just, you know, it's a newsletter. I do teach classes um, with that you can find here at simplertrading.com slash store. But I think that the best place to start is just a membership at Simpler Foundation. So within Simpler Foundation, I am the head of that. And I do um, a couple different videos per week based on learning about uh, learning about options, how they work. I have a full learning center in there. I also do um, a weekly Friday video where I go over a couple of different options trades. And within that, I always, you know, I try to stick with um, the the most basic ones so that people can learn the concepts, right? And so that's um, a pretty good place to start out. Um, I have this I have a section in there called Dear Simpler, where I create videos where people ask just exactly that, you know, how do you, how do you get started options trading? Uh, People ask me all kinds of stuff. What about the IV crush? What do you do for earnings season? This is one of my colleagues, TG. How do you do pinning plays? This kind of stuff. So people write questions in there. So I think that um, Simpler Foundation is a pretty good place to start. And then I do the playbook as well. That's my weekly review. Our options membership at Simpler Trading. We also, we run a trading room all day. It's not the best place to start for beginners, but that is my primary duty that I do. So we have, I generally do an hour per day in the trading room um, where I do all types of options trades. But if you want to get started, the free one. The free one is a newsletter, and then the uh, if you're interested in a membership, then I can get you a deal for like nine dollars a month. It's pretty cheap. So awesome. Just, yeah. Okay. One last question. Of course. Uh, this goes back to your trading of options. There was a question that came in and asked about what expiration time do you usually use. So you said you know obviously if it's close then you know you don't have much time to to make your trades but it do you look out 30 days 60 days 90 days i mean what would you typically look at so it, it completely depends on the setup and we can use that other one that you used as what was that ticker that you gave me fldm yes and full disclosure i own this one so <laughs> tell so, me <laughs> he gave me this one i really like this one i think the pattern's great it looks awesome So for the setup that we're talking about, the run into earnings in particular, the thing that's important about it is you have to buy the options in the series of earnings. Because of the way that the IV increases going into earnings, it increases the most in that series. So you have to look at your options chain and say, okay, well, if the earnings is on May 2nd, that's going to be in this series right here. So you see how the IV is at 71% here and on this one that's after earnings, it's at 59%. Normally you would think, oh, I want more time, right? Yes, normally you would. In a normal directional setup, 
I would I would go about 30 days out. But for the run into earnings, you don't want that series because this is the one that has the increasing IV. So with that one, you would look to do something like this. And I mean, this is really cheap. This is I'm going to do this one in the trading room later. It's a dollar 30 per contract. So something like that is right in my wheelhouse. Um, you know, and just look to get like three. Right, are, we, are we splitting this when you buy this? Or are we? Gonna <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a uh, no. I mean, this is what I this is what I do all day in the trading room. So we look for <laughs> look for ideas, and I love that idea. I'm gonna show my trading partner that one. But another one that I really like is Alibaba. So for example, same thing here. This one typically has a good run into earnings. It's a little bit early to start it. It's three weeks ahead of time. Um, I would prefer a better pullback, but same thing here. I mean, you, you just look for the earnings series, which is gonna be this one right here. So it's the one with the high IV. So right now it's 35%, but that thing will get up to like 80% at least. So okay. if you go down and these are much more expensive. So for this one, these Delta 70s are $11 a piece. That's going to be, you know, the other one only cost you $1.50 or so. This one's costing you $2,300. The other, the other trade was only like $240. So for something like that, yes, I would definitely have a 50% stop loss because it's very expensive. But for the other one that costs $1.40, I would just put it on and, and let it go. All right. Well, when you go back and you're talking to your partner and you're in your trading room and all, just remember, <laughs> just remember to give credit where credit is due for oh i will i will tell them for sure i'm gonna be like they found this at stock charts and it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, a lot of our members uh really like your really like your site and they keep telling me that i need to use the um that i need to use the oh what's that called the seasonality yes yeah Yes. So our members were excited. I told them I was coming over here today and they're like, no, you're not leaving. Are you I'm like, no, I'm not leaving. I'm just <laughs> doing the thing. So, um, yeah, it was, they're looking forward to it. A lot of our members really like stock charts. They like your service. And, um, I think it would be really cool to do a couple more things together. Okay. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Just be sure when you tell them where this came from, that you don't tell them that it was a blind squirrel theory that <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> well and before you leave danielle definitely email me the link to those um slides and I'll oh yes. publish yes. them in our recap tonight because i know a lot of viewers will probably want to look at those yes definitely i can do that yep um, just aaron h at stockcharts.com Oh, great. Okay, cool. I will do that. I will definitely send you over the slides. I know how helpful it is to have uh, slides to look over. Absolutely. And Danielle, it is always a pleasure to have you on the show. We really don't talk too much about options. So this is fascinating and very interesting, I'm sure, for a lot of our viewers. So thank you so much for stopping by today. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me. Oh, we'll definitely have you back. Awesome. Let me know. I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> All right. Well, how's tomorrow sound? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're based in Seattle, right? Are you in yes. Seattle or? Well, I'm not, but the, yes, uh, Stock Charts is out near Seattle. Oh, excellent. Because I'm from Seattle. Oh, are you a, are you a Seahawk fan? Uh, not, uh, not so much, Fair but point. yeah, sure. <laughs> Better <laughs> answer. There you go. Depends on who you're talking to, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, a, I'm a Seahawk fan between 12 and 1.30 every weekday. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That's great. Yeah, it was great having you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have an excellent rest of your day. All right, you too. You bet. Bye. All right. And there we go. Uh, another great presentation by Danielle. It is. I know that we do get a lot of questions about options. So it was great having her on the show today. Absolutely. Okay. We are going to jump in and this is going to be record time because I know we're getting started late on the 10 and 10, but this is, uh, I'm going to jump right in and we're going to start. First stock today is Zillow Group. I can tell you I'm not a fan. It is holding on to support. So if there's one thing maybe to cling to, it's that. But you've got the publishers moving higher, making uh, on the verge of making a pretty big breakout. And yet look what the stock's been doing throughout this entire time. I mean, we're back to where we were in August in the overall index. And Zillow has lost probably 
I don't know, maybe 40% of its value in that time. So you've got one of the worst performing stocks in the space. So if it loses price support, there's no reason to hold. I'd be careful with this one. All righty. Most popular in the chat room is going to be iPay. Oh, iPay. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I don't have the relative uh, stuff. So let's just go ahead and pull it up on the regular chart. Um, it has been moving up. Light volume. A lot of days below 100,000 shares. Many days well below 100,000 shares. And you can see going back six months, the highest volume day is 400,000. So this is not something that I would be interested in, even though it is an ETF. Maybe I, I didn't notice that at first, but the ETF maybe makes it a little bit more palatable because I don't worry about volume as much with an ETF because it's going to price based on its ba basket of stocks that it tracks. Um, I do like the overall movement in the chart, though, continuing to trade above that 20-day moving average. So I would simply say as long as you continue to trade uh, above that moving average, um, you know, it seems like each time we come down and test it, uh, we get a reversal. Um, if I could draw, whoops, okay, now I'm just losing my mind here. Um, let's try this again. Okay, so each time we get down here, you can see we're getting some nice reaction off of the 20 day. We just did it again recently. It looks to me like we're going to break out, so I do like iPay going forward. All right, let's see. Next one up, uh, let's see, C I E N, Sienna. Oh, I love Sienna. This is mm -hmm. one I probably could have asked Danielle about as well. But I like the move back to the upside. I hope it finishes stronger. Um, the breakout, a breakout above forty and a half, forty-one dollars would be really bullish because that's where we saw this free fall down to about the forty-one level, and then we kind of consolidated a little bit before we went a little lower. But I think we've got a cup building here on Sienna. So what I would be looking for for this, or at least for it to continue, would be the move here down to this low and now back up. I think you can kind of see the shape of a cup taking place. I like the fact the volume starting to pick up here on the right side. I believe eventually we're going to move back up to that 45, 46 area. So I like Sienna. All righty. Next one up. Uh, let's see. FLIR Systems, F-L-I-R. Yep. And I do own Sienna, by the way. So I just want to make sure that was clear. FLIR, uh, beautiful move today. Great volume. It's trying to make the breakout. Only one thing would bother me here, and that is if we fail to hold the breakout. We've got it intraday on big volume. If we leave a long tail to the upside and come back down, it's not that I don't like the stock, but in the short term, I think that would be a little bit of a warning sign. So something to keep an eye on into today's close. All righty. Next up would be TD Ameritrade, AMTD. Yeah, this one, along with my setup for this week, not particularly uh, uh, good. I had ET e trade ETFC, but with the 10 year Treasury yield rolling back over again and back below the 20 day moving average, many of these financials struggling this week and certainly underperforming on a relative basis. Um, I think with uh, Ameritrade, I mean, you had the double bottom. We broke down on big volume, tried to get through. We barely made it yesterday and then right back down. I believe Ameritrade came out with uh, earnings. And I'm going to see if I have those numbers. I do. They missed on their top line and they matched on their bottom line. So nothing inspiring at all about this stock, considering most companies are blowing away their estimates. Ameritrade did not. Negative reaction. I think until the stock gets through about 54 and a half with some volume, I would uh, look elsewhere. All right. Let's continue on. AT&T. All right. AT&T also reported. Uh, they reported this morning, and let's see what's going on on the stock. Um, yeah, pulling back. I could go out a year. I think this one had some challenges ahead from what I remember. I think I looked at this one recently. Yeah, you can see the overhead resistance. I think I talked about this being a sell until we could get through this overhead resistance. I think that's pretty clear. You've got double top, and you could almost go back to this move back in, uh, was it June? of 2018. I think 32 and a half, 3275 is a big level to get through. Couldn't do it. Came out with earnings, big volume, and we're moving back down again. I think uh, my point on this one was if you're an, you know, an income investor, you're looking for the dividend, AT&T is nice. Otherwise, I don't see this as a momentum trade if I'm looking for capital appreciation. So I would pass on it. All right. This one we discussed on Monday setup, Stenbury Resources, DNR. The person says, what the heck happened here? <laughs> um, well, you know, I would watch the 20-day moving average. It's, you know, these types of stocks are extremely volatile. 
Um, and I think that was the same day I might have mentioned this as a sleeper pick or I don't remember what segment. Yeah, actually, it was a staff pick, but, you know, I didn't want to throw him under the bus. <laughs> well, I know, but I mean, even before I knew it was a staff pick, I had gone over this stock and I was I pointed out the fact that with volume it was coming up. Um, but the problem is the longer term chart on Denbury, where you can see it was a, a six and a half dollar stock in October. And yes, it's been strengthening, but it's only a two and a half dollar stock now. So on a relative basis, this has been a stock that's been under pressure, but the volume was starting to come in and we were threatening a pretty good breakout here. I personally would watch this rising 20 day moving average. We had a breakout. It's not unusual to lose the breakout, but I think to go back and lose that recent low in the 20 day moving average would be very bearish for me. So that's what I would watch the downside. All right. Uh, let's see. In medical supplies, Edwards Life Sciences, EW. Yeah, EW just reported its earnings as well. Uh, they reported last night after the bell, and they beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line, and they guided their fiscal year 19 earnings per share higher. Uh, you wouldn't know it by looking at the today's reaction at uh, down 1.9%. I think some of that may be related to the group that it's in, just in healthcare. Healthcare has been underperforming for a bit, but I think that this has been a pretty decent looking stock. And I'm just going to draw a couple of levels here. This was a prior high. Here was also a couple of highs coming in around 180 before we gapped up. This is an area I'd watch closely. I think if we close back below 175, I'd be careful. But I actually think this could be re reversing off of this level. A move back up through the 20 day moving average is what I'd want to see. All right. This one is continuing to uh, take off. Well, not today, but uh, Qualcomm. Yeah, Qualcomm, I believe, was uh, upgraded. A lot of stuff going on with Qualcomm. But the big news is that their their dispute with Apple has been settled. And ever since that happened at three o'clock in the afternoon on, on April 16th, we have seen continuing push to the upside. And look at the volume. That's unmistakable. I think the market is relieved that Qualcomm no longer has this cloud hanging over it. And as a result, I think if we got a pullback anywhere down into the area in the mid 70s, I would think that's probably about all you're going to see here. I certainly would not be expecting to see any kind of a move back to 57 and a half. So I think Qualcomm has completely changed its character with this development and settling its dispute with uh, Apple. And I think there was also news that Intel was getting out of the 5G market, which also was a benefit to Qualcomm. So that was a one two punch and traders love it. And I think there's a lot of accumulation taking place here. So it's overbought, but I believe short term pullback, especially down to around 80 or into the upper 70s, would start to get my attention here. All righty. And that does. Uh, oh, no, we have one more. True. T-R-U. Yeah. TransUnion is one I talked about recently um, in one of the hot areas. I loved this pullback down to test the 20 day moving average in that hammer. Um, but it did trade down intraday to about 66 so I would just simply say that that the key range for me to the downside would be uh, probably that prior low, which is just below 68, and then the tail on earnings, because that's where the selling turned around. That's where buyers came back in at 66. And I think this is a stock that has been uh, at least beginning to show a lot more life. I think if you go below $66, though, especially on a close, I would be out of the stock. Um, I don't have the relative chart up here, but there are others within the space that have done better on a relative basis. So because it's been a little bit of a relative laggard, I'm not going to give it a whole lot of room to the downside. Close below 66, I'd watch this one. All right. And that does conclude the 10 in 10. Here are the symbols. I will have these up in the Market Watchers Live chart list. Just go to the Articles tab, click on the Market Watchers Live recap, and you will find the link at the top. And yes, in all of the recaps. All right. Time for our final market update. Let's uh, move on. Excellent job, Tom. Whew, take a breath. <laughs> I, I, I think I did it in about nine minutes. That's about as fast as I think. <laughs> that was quick. All right, final market update. Well, as you can see, the markets are starting to pull back a bit here. I'm, and I'm going to make sure we have the absolute. Yep, here we go. So we had, uh, you know, we were making a, our way back into positive territory here, but now we are pulling back somewhat. And you can see starting to challenge the intraday low for the NASDAQ. S&P 500 already is broken down below that intraday low. S&P 400 hit that top, starting to move back down, but stayed in positive territory 
and so far staying in positive territory, along with the Russell 2000. So small and mid caps certainly uh, showing relative strength today. TSX, uh, big slide right now, down almost 95 points. And we can see TSX, big gap down, but now moving sideways, currently 2.522%. And you see the VIX starting to take off here on this decline. Once we started to see prices hit that high and move down, as you can see, heading right back up, uh, currently at 13.2, still not that elevated, but for right now it is. Uh, UUP big gap up, still continuing for the dollar. And interestingly, gold is also taken off this morning. It has pulled back some of those profits, but still on the positive side and up 38 cents, 120.50 for GLD. USO down about uh, three quarters of a percent, as you can see, but consolidating sideways may have stopped the slide for today. And then finally, TLT big gap up, uh, continued and reach that intraday high. Looks like it's pulling back just a little bit. Hit, an, uh, hit down here on that rounded bottom. Looks like we might be starting our way back up for TLT. And whew, quickly, as far as our sectors go, real estate uh, up almost a half a percent. Everybody else uh, sort of wishy-washy. Our big uh, laggard today would be the energy sector. It is down over one and a quarter percent. Passing it back to you, Tom. All right. Yeah. Real estate is what I kind of wanted to focus in on here for just a second. Um, I, you know, a bull market is made up um, of a lot of things, but one thing is wide participation to the upside. And so even though some groups may be lagging on a relative basis, on an absolute basis, just about everything is going higher. Um, the XLRE, for instance, has been moving up. We made the breakout above that December top. And so far on a pullback here, we held that. I think $34, $35 is a key area of support on the absolute chart for XLRE. And then on a relative basis, we've been really struggling in April so far, but I think the key lows to watch is this double bottom down around 0 0.0120. And that, uh, that number is simply taking the XLRE and dividing it into the S&P 500. But if we were to break in, you know, to a five or six month relative low and begin to lose some of these support levels, that would be a problem. I don't think these support levels are going to go. I think if the market keeps going up, what we might see is real estate just simply moving and taking more of a back seat to some of the other aggressive areas. But these are a couple levels I'd watch for the on the XLRE. All right, we are going to move into our final segment, which is what would you do? I don't know if you've seen the poll yet, but feel free to fill it out if you haven't. Um, essentially, the question is, we've got Microsoft and Facebook both coming out after the bell today with earnings. And I know, you know, I'm not a fan of holding stocks into earnings, but if you look at these two stocks, the question is, which stock would you would you buy it or would you sell it heading into its earnings report? And so, Aaron, we each have, I don't know, maybe three or four minutes to take a look at this and we can, then we can go over the uh, poll with everybody. But what would you do with Facebook and Microsoft? All righty. Well, I decided to look daily, weekly, monthly to support my conclusions. I actually like Facebook and I would consider it a buy right now. And here are the reasons. Broke out through that overhead resistance from that trading zone we had. Uh, it's pulling back again. Love the breakouts, love the pullback to the point of breakout. We've got a PMO that did a bull kiss. Uh, notice scooters starting to show some intermediate long term uh, strength and even rising bottoms right now on the OBV in conjunction with the rising price. So shorter term, it looks good to me. When I go to the weekly chart, I think it looks especially good. We got the PMO buy signal in oversold territory, continuing higher, plenty of room to continue higher, and a beautiful flag formation, which a measurement would certainly take it past all-time highs. So I think Facebook on all of those counts looks good. When I took a look at the monthly chart, at first I was thinking, ah, I don't know, but we are seeing that PMO turning around so far this month. And of course the month will close out April 30th. And if you look, take a look at that chart, I suspect we are gonna uh, continue to see this little flag and the breakout. I'm looking for a move to all time highs on Facebook. So I like it, I would consider it a buy right now. Microsoft is a little bit of a different story. And, you know, we had to say buy or sell. I have to say that for me, I would be looking at a hold. Uh, I think it still has more room to run, but I 
don't want to chase it. And it really in the short term too, you can see that parabolic kind of shape. Yes, we have those, um, like I said, a lot of ascending, tri uh, ascending wedges, which are bearish. I'm not paying too close of attention to that, but I think that it's still vulnerable. Uh, but notice OBV volume, goodness, how do you even argue with that? But like I said, I think it's you know been a runner. I would wanna see a little bit more of a pullback uh, before I would get into it in the shorter term. Weekly chart, I think looks very good. The only problem is that's a really steep rising uh, trend channel. Those are really hard to continue and keep up. Uh, so I would still be looking, like I said, for a little bit of a pullback. Yes, we've got the PM on the buy signal. One of the reasons I would remain on it with a hold. And look at the parabolic, of course, on the monthly chart. Not a surprise. It's a tech stock. Um, that's, you know, sort of what has happened with a lot of them. This one, you did get that bull kiss. It actually gave you the sell signal, but now it is punched right back through. You can see the breakout that we had last month. Uh, and now it's continuing, we're getting some nice follow through. So I think Microsoft looks good. I'm not saying it doesn't, but I'm gonna go in the sell category. I'd book those profits. I certainly wouldn't be buying in right now. I just think it's uh, it needs to pull back. And those were mine. So whew, I did mine very quickly now. <laughs> Hopefully gave you plenty of time. Yeah, I, um, I'm gonna go opposite. We kind of joked about this earlier. Um, but I actually like Microsoft and I don't like Facebook. Um, and I'll point out, and it's, again, I think this just kind of illustrates how, you know, we look at the same chart and just come up with different opinions. And I don't th I think that's kind of normal. Um, the key is just to make sure if you're wrong, uh, you're not wrong for long. That was a, a friend of mine that uh, used to say that <laughs> on uh, the radio when he would come on with me years ago. And I always like that. You know, if you're wrong, you don't want to be wrong for long. Make sure you have your stops in play. Yes. But, um, Facebook here. I think after the huge gap down and that massive disappointment in July, you can see the reaction high was up at around 188, 189. And this rally here has been, I mean, yes, it's going higher, but you can see Facebook now at 182. It's all time high was at 220. We just saw the NASDAQ break out to an all time high. So clearly Facebook on a relative basis is not performing particularly well. And I think you've got some overhead resistance. Now, maybe the earnings tonight will be blowout, and that'll be the catalyst to get us through this uh, resistance. I do believe we're in a bull market, and I think a rising tide lifts all boats. So this is certainly something that I, I would expect that Facebook goes higher just because I really think the market goes higher. But when I look at the volume, it's just not exactly exploding to the upside. It doesn't look like there's a lot of accumulation. I'm just a little nervous. When I look at the... Uh, relative chart, Facebook relative to the internet stocks, it topped back in February, beginning of February with this gap up. So even though absolute on an absolute basis, we've been moving higher, we're not even keeping up with the peers. And so I, that bothers me. If the volume's not coming in, we're not seeing the accumulation and we're not getting the relative breakout. I think that there's still some cautiousness um, on Wall Street with Facebook. I just don't know that the company is trusted and I think a lot of it still stems back to that huge miss when they misled, in my opinion, misled Wall Street. No reason the stock should be trading at an all-time high only to come out and deliver the blow that it did back in July of 2018. So maybe I'm still thinking too much about that. Um, got a little scar there. I didn't own it, so uh, I didn't lose anything on it. But I just that left a bad taste in my mouth. And uh, I guess being a CPA and feeling like the management team should be a little bit more upfront with uh, Wall Street, that still lingers for me. So I'm going to say Facebook, if I was in it, I would sell. I wouldn't trust them going into earnings. Um, I think that there are a lot of other internet stocks that look a lot better. But to be honest, I would have said the same thing about Twitter. And we saw a huge response when Twitter came out. So I think when you go into earnings, you just don't know. But my opinion based on what I'm seeing on the chart is I would sell Facebook. I wouldn't take a chance. You can see the internet stocks, by the way, broke out above that February high on a relative basis to the S&P and Facebook is not doing the same relative to its peers. So I just think that there's a little overhang here that I'd be a little leery of. Next up is Microsoft. And I think we got a different ball game here. Microsoft had its high in October. We are now well above that. We are in a group where we have broken out not only to an all time high, but on into an all time relative high. So software is again leading the market to the upside. Microsoft for the last three months 
unlike Facebook, has been outperforming a very strong software group, and it's been wildly outperforming the S&P 500. So I think Wall Street likes what it's seeing with uh, Microsoft. I believe we're going to see a much stronger report on Microsoft than we will on Facebook, but it has gone up quite a bit. And I think, Aaron, you made a good point. This is a stock that is now priced for perfection. Mm -hmm. And if they don't deliver a huge report, I think we could see a pullback, although I do believe that pullback would be viable. But I'm going to say buy uh, Microsoft and sell Facebook. And I'm really interested to see. <laughs> I'm actually looking. I think it was very interesting um, what the uh, poll is showing right now. We'll show that in a moment, though. Yeah, yeah like I said, I would probably hold Microsoft. But honestly, you know, with your strategy of selling before the earnings, I don't think that's a bad idea either. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's getting, you know, when you look at the if you look at the Microsoft chart and you look at it over the last two months, you'll see a lot more volume on the up days than volume on the down days. And say, and the opposite holds true for Facebook. I just the way it sets up, the way I interpret the charts, I would be a seller of Facebook and buyer of Microsoft. Yep. And isn't it interesting? That's how we do. <laughs> yes, it is. But here, oh, sell both. <laughs> yeah, see? There I thought go. that was very interesting. All right. I mean, um, I, mean right. I can see booking those profits, like I said. And I mean, I can see the concerns with Facebook. I mean, it's not been one of my favorite stocks. Uh, in that space for sure. But just looking at, at it, uh, you know, because I had to look exactly just at that, you know, I was, I mean, I thought the chart still technically looks pretty good, but I can see why people would say that. Yeah. I mean, definitely the price momentum has been building. And like I said, uh, you know, from an absolute perspective, um, most stocks are looking pretty good. If you just look at the stock and you don't pay any attention to what the S&P 500 has been doing and your stock's up 10 percent year to date, you're thinking, hey, I'm having this stock's been great. Well, if the S&P 500 is up 20 percent year to date, 10 percent isn't such a great deal. And that, I think, is the problem with that I have with Facebook. It's ah, yes. Up, but it's not keeping pace with the overall market. And that makes me scratch my head. All right. That is quite interesting. It's so yeah, the the audience wanted to get rid of both. That's fascinating. Yeah. Well, maybe they kind of don't like to hold into earnings, which I I definitely would agree with. Um, oh yeah, we maybe should have caveated that because I mean, let's face it, typically you wouldn't be buying before earnings. Yeah, I would not. But I do think that the I do think the results that come out after the bell, um, I'm going to place a higher odd that Microsoft beats revenue and earnings estimates more so than Facebook. But we'll All right. Well, we'll know that tomorrow, won't we? We will. We can talk about it tomorrow and see what kind of fool I've made of myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. All right. Let's see. We got just, uh, what, another minute or so here. Uh, you can see the Dow Jones Industrial Average has bounced off the earlier low that Aaron was talking about at our last update, but it's still down 43, NASDAQ down 7. But I'll tell you what, you know, with the market coming up as much as it has, when you look at profit taking like this, it's a little different than what we saw back in 2018, where we would look and the Dow Jones would be down, you know, 30 points one minute and then down 260 the next time we'd look at it. I mean, we're not seeing that kind of selling, impulsive type selling. And so when we do get pullbacks, I think it's much more contained and seems to have that bullish flavor to it. Indeed. Yeah. And, you know, I, I did want to mention, I, I think it was talked about in the chat room real quick, is the fact that, uh, you know, we haven't seen the kind of volume that we would, may want to see on a breakout like we did to all time highs yesterday. So, you know, I Carl sent me an email right after I did my very bullish blog. And uh, with that information, <laughs> I was like, well, that does temper my bullishness, I have to say. Well, you know, Julius was on the show. We're going to wrap up here in just a second. But Julius was on the show not too long ago. And I told him, I said, you know, if you go back in history, you generally don't get a lot of volume on the upside. You don't get too much panic buying. You get a lot of panic selling, though. And that's why the volume, in my opinion, tends to, tends to be a lot stronger to the downside. I do pay attention to volume on individual stocks, but I think the market, you got to be careful doing that. Oh, yeah. Great. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being with us today. A special thank you to Danielle Shea for joining us. That was a great segment. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit 
As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Happy trading. Thank you.